There we go. All right, so ectoparasites, mites part two, fleas, flies, excuse me, and lice. Uh, one of the most effective ways to get owner compliance if you find some of these mites is to show them what it looks like on the microscope. It's what, been one of my favorite things to do, especially with cat ear mites, because owners just can't imagine that those fat little bugs are going around in the ear like this. Um, so if your vet allows it, definitely have them, the owner, come and look at the microscope. It is extremely effective. Also for Demodex, uh, it's very effective. So if you remember, last time we covered follicular mites and burrowing mites. So this time, we're going to cover surface mites. And if you're unsure where this PowerPoint is, it's in the ectoparasites of large and small animals folder. Okay, this is the second part. Okay, so first, let's talk about the mite of cattle and sheep, okay? So first off, this is a reportable disease. All right, we've had a couple this semester that have been reportable diseases. I really want you guys to know when they're reportable. It's okay if you don't know who to report it to or what the steps are, but you need to know this specific parasite is one that we need to report. All right, so um, in U.S. cattle we see this. However, it has been cured from sheep, so that's a beautiful thing. All right, but uh, what we're going to see is the animal is extremely itchy. Hopefully you guys remember what puritis or puritic means. Very itchy. And because of that, we will see a lot of cuts and scrapes. Whenever you have large animals that are itchy, they itch against things. So fences, trees. So usually there's big cuts with it too. All right. Um, these infestations of these mites are much more common in cooler weather. All right. That's the blank. Which if you have friends that are not here tonight, the answers to these blanks are also in the notes section of the PowerPoint. Uh, more likely in feedlot cattle. Why would that be? Just throw some ideas out there as to why this might be more common in animals in a feedlot. What? It's crowded. it's crowded. Yeah. So we've got more sources to infect. What's another thought? <clears throat> you think it's a very calm environment? Oh, no. no, no, no. Right? So if it is a busy happening, what's another word for that? Someone say? Yeah. How do you feel right now? Are you very stressed? <laughs> It's a stressful environment, and stress lowers our immune system, right? So, absolutely, feedlot situations, we're always going to have a higher instance of disease, okay? All right, so how do we diagnose it? Skin scraping, just like all the other mites. And remember, we have to scrape deep, deep enough. Even with these being surface mites, we still want to get a good scrape, okay? Now, in cattle, keep in mind, what is their hide used for? Leather, leather. So it's going to be very hard to end up making them bleed just by scraping it, okay? But you want to really scrape through some of those top layers so that you can get a good sample, a good diagnostic sample. All right? We usually treat them with pour-ons, all right, or sprays. There's these big canisters that you put on your back, and I'm not going to lie, you look like a Ghostbuster. And you spray the top of the cow with a stick, Okay, and um, just like the pest man that comes to your house and does like, you know, pest control, looks just like that, but you're spraying the cow with it. Um, and that's what they'll do to treat them. They'll run them through shoots, and so the cows will line up in the big feedlot shoots, and they'll just go down and spray cow by cow by cow. So there's definitely not an exact um, dosing to these medications. Uh, a lot of those machines will come with a little pump that you can pull out and pump in, and that essentially charges the little machine to dispense a certain volume, and you do like one of those per cow, all right? Why are withdrawal times important? First off, what is a withdrawal time? Do you guys know? Yeah, that's, that's perfect for cattle. So withdrawal time is the amount of time from when you've taken the medication to when it's out of your system, okay? And why that matters with these guys is because we eat them. Right? So we really have to pay attention to, especially if it's a feedlot cow, how soon is it going to be sold? How soon is it going to go to slaughter? Because it can't have some of these medications in their system. All right? See, it's, it's very, very important. And by the way, even if someone has a food animal as a pet, I've been loving all these videos of cows that live inside. <laughs> yes. What is the withdrawal time? Oh, yeah. And you know what, Dr. I, when I attend her lectures, 
they, it varies for each one. And she always tells the students, I am not going to make you memorize the withdrawal time because the vet doesn't even know the withdrawal time. He's going to look at the insert with the drug because, yeah, it varies for every drug. You just have to know that there is one, and this is a food animal. So even if you have a food animal as a pet, like I keep finding these adorable little cows that get raised inside and then the people play with them with balls and things and it's so cute. You still have to treat that as a food animal, even though the likelihood of them eating that little cow is between slim and none, you still have to think of it as one. So even if people have you know, backyard pet chickens that are for eggs and they're never gonna actually slaughter them, eat them, still have to worry about that. All right, so let's talk about this one. All right, um, I know the first word is seropthes, and I think it's caniculi, but I'm not gonna lie, you might have to look that pronunciation up. Uh, this essentially is going to be ear mites in rabbits, okay? I have personally had a rabbit with these ear mites, and it looks just like that. Um, and a little bit, it reminded me when I looked in the canal of if you took, um, uh, oh gosh, what are those? Cornflakes. I was thinking, what cereal does my husband put honey on? Cornflakes and you like stacked a bunch together and you look down in the ear canal, that's what it looks like. And it, they come out in flakes, it's just whoa. Um, and the rabbit's ear becomes rock hard. I mean, if you try to clean that or massage it to get oil down in there, it's not budging. It's like a solid rock of the skin and debris that these mites have digested and then defecated back out and whew. Um, so, I've got a video this is the mites. Yeah. Ooh, ooh. Lots of babies, yeah. And then the big one. Okay, and this is kind of a reddish area. That's going to be blood that has been as a cause of these little mites. But I mean, they just create a whole almost honeycomb environment inside that because rabbits' ears and rabbits have big ears. So lots of nice environment for them to um, hide in. These guys are actually much more common in the rabbits whose ears open up than the ones that flop over, okay? I feel like the flops would be a greater environment because they're protected, and, but no, you're gonna see it a lot more common in the ears that are open up. Oh my goodness. So you can imagine how much the owner's gonna freak out about that A, being in her house, and B, being in her pet, you know, and they're gonna wanna treat these animals. Whew. Look at them all. Talk about a stressful feedlot environment. It's like oh, so many sizes. Yeah, yeah. Tons of life stages. We got grandpa mite and grandma mite and sister mite and brother mite. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, if left untreated, the rabbit will actually start losing fur all the way towards uh, towards a rostral direction towards the nose. Um, Oh, and as you can imagine, it itches. So like in this picture, perfect. You can see where the rabbit has used his back legs trying to scratch and it's just pulled off fur from that area. Oof. A lot of people will try to treat this um, at home and they'll use oils. So like an olive oil or a, uh, I've seen vegetable oil used. It suffocates the mite to an extent but there's just so much in there. And you really have to try and clean all that out. And rabbits are not the greatest for being sedated and they stress really easy. And if you've ever owned one, you have to be very careful that they don't kick really hard with their back legs because they can actually break their spine in one spot. So it's a tricky thing to have to treat for. And sadly, a lot of owners wait until it gets bad before coming in. So it's, it's a definite battle there. Um, but we treat it very similar to how we treat our other um, larger animals, even the smaller ones. Ivermectin is always a go-to for treating any kind of mite. Usually when we do the diagnosis, we don't have to do a skin scrape. We could just pull out one of those flakes and put it on a microscope and see that. Yes, ma'am? So is this parasite only in rabbits? Or? No, it can affect goats too. It's just definitely more common in rabbits. Yuck. I like this picture because you can see the egg. Isn't that cool? It's like an ultrasound and a microscope picture all at once. I just love it. All right, so um, as you can see this one, there's a couple of different species. We have bovis is going to be our, anyone? 
What? Yes, bovine, cattle, caprine, capra, goats, very good. Equine, very, very good, guys. All right, its common name is leg mange. Okay, so obviously predilection site, it's gonna be on the legs, the surface of the legs. All right, we see a lot of scabbing with this one, okay, because uh, this one, it's easier for the animal to scratch themselves using their other leg and wear off the hair, and then it gets a little oozy and then scabs over. Are you seeing a trend with when we see these mites? actually from a hedgehog. Uh, for some reason I just don't picture hedgehogs getting mites and this was kind of an incidental finding because they're not one of the primary hosts but I just thought that was so so neat. Like those little spikies can get mites in there. Yeah they can. All right so again same treatments that we've been seeing. Ditto ditto ditto. Um, on this one you guys are not going to have to identify a picture of it on your test, okay? So I recommend that you know the common name. You need to know this word, however you would like to pronounce it, to spell it right. Species, okay? Um, let's see here. Yeah, that's really what I care about, the common name and the uh, scientific name on this one. There's some more pictures of it. These mites look very similar. You know, very similar. On this one, I do feel like its legs are a little more cranial and a little more caudal than some of the other ones where they're spread out. Let's see this one, they kind of go a little more further down the body, whereas this one, they're a little more cranial. But again, it's tricky to tell the difference between them. And as you've seen, the treatments are so similar that who cares which type of mite it is? We just want to get rid of it, <laughs> right? <laughs> All right, so our... Uh, Next one here is one that we are going to see in our dogs and cats. It is known as walking dandruff, okay? So as you can imagine, when we see this on dogs and cats and rabbits too, uh, we see little white kind of flakes that this uh, mite has chewed up and spit out. It is very contagious between pets. It is also very contagious to people. Yikes, all right? Transmission is by direct contact or fomites. What's a fomite? Inanimate object. Very good, Kennedy. Yes, it's going to be an inanimate object. So your shoes, a pillow, a blanket. All right. It is going to cause some itching, but not as bad as some of the other ones we've seen. Okay, especially like scabies. It's not going to be nearly as itchy as scabies. Okay. Um, when we say scaly skin, all right, that's different from scabs, okay? Scabs are usually adhered to the skin and you have to pick at them to get them off, right? Scales, you'll usually see kind of it flaking a little bit and then you can just kind of pop it off rather easily. That's more what a scaly skin would be as opposed to a scab. You guys remember what alopecia is? Hair loss. <coughs> Hair loss, very good. Try to incorporate some good review of your medical terms as we go through these. Um, all right, so this one, because of those scales, we can use a cellophane tape method on this one to diagnose it, all right? And that's nice because it's a lot less painful for the pet, right? Um, sometimes even a flea comb can be used as we brush through the hair. Those little sca uh, scales will come off, and then we can just look at it under a microscope. We do have some different treatments that we are seeing right here. Um, that selamectin, uh, excuse me, that is found in Revolution. So that's a cat topical that we use for flea and tick prevention and heartworm preventative. All right, so that's nice. It's already in one of those drugs. Uh, pyrethins are another drug category that we use for treatment of mites and things. Um, they're very safe, which is nice, and uh, probably our top go-to for this category. That's just FYI for you guys to know. I don't expect you to memorize treatments because the doctor is going to do it. I just want you to kind of start hearing it so that it'll get easier when you get to pharmacology. Um, I've got some students in here that are in pharmacology who are learning so many drugs so fast 
if you even just look at one, you're like, you know what, I remember hearing that once before, it's gonna help you, so. All right, Ododectes cyanosis. Very, 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 very common. This is the ear mite, okay? It is intensely itchy, intensely itchy. All right, when you have a cat that comes into the clinic that's losing fur around its ears and you look in the ear and you see all this brown gunk, this is what it is, I promise you, all right? Especially in shelter cats and outdoor cats and strays, we see this all the time. I didn't have a ch chance to check my new foster before I left, but this is one of the very first things I do is look inside their ear and make sure they don't have these mites because they're just so common. It's gonna look like someone literally put maybe some melted chocolate in the ear. It's dark brown, and if you pull it out, it's waxy. So think of just the dirtiest Q-tip you're gonna pull out of your ear, but dark, okay? Um, it's very easy to see the mites under microscope. You just take that Q-tip that you swab their ear out of. You don't even have to usually go very deep to get a sample. You just kind of spread it on the microscope slide and you can see it, okay? Um, if y'all remember in intro, we talked about sometimes with ear cytology, we heat fix the slide, where we take the lighter and just sweep it underneath the slide just so that the sample will stick, kind of melt some of the earwax and sticks it. We never want to do that when we're looking for mites. Why do you guys think? Because it kills them. It kills them. Cooks them. Exactly. Cooks them. And then we don't get to see them as much. Uh, they'll break apart. And plus, you're not going to get to show the owners how they're moving. So. Um, you can also, using an otoscope, be able to look in the ear, and if you can get the cat to hold still enough, you will see the little white mites amongst the brown exudate. Okay, it's disgusting. Really disgusting. So I've got videos. Ooh, look at it. Oh. It's got whiskers like the cat. That just looks awful. It's got little rabbit. Yeah, they're in here at the seer. How do they have those really long? I, you know, I don't know why. I really don't. I know that uh, last year the group asked about if they were looking under the microscope at mites, and they found two little tiny like leg type things that are yeah. down near the groin area of the mite, and they were so curious, so we looked it up, and sure enough, it's a type of leg that's only used in reproduction. And so I wonder if maybe the, the you'll have to look it up to see if the, uh, you're like, <laughs> but it, it'd be curious if there's some interesting, uh, reason why they have such long whiskers essentially. All right, so I want you to try and find the eggs. What do you guys think? First off, do you see the mite? Yeah. yeah. yeah he's moving. So the mite's over here. What do you think are the eggs? Don't overthink it. All of these are eggs. Isn't that crazy? And then this is like their nest. <laughs> Okay, when you pull it out of the ear, this is a giant gunk of something brown. Okay, and so when you're looking at it under the microscope, there will be tons of things that you cannot see through. So you're looking along the edges. And sometimes you have to sit there for a second and watch for movement. And if you don't see anything, but you pulled this brown exudate out of the cat's ears, get another sample or smush it around a little more because they're going to be there. You just didn't move it around on the slide well enough. So, oof. Look at go. Oh, there's a friend up top, too. Oh, the little one over here. Yes. What are you doing? Yeah, what are you? Probably trying to escape the warm thing. You know, those microscopes are warm when you turn the light on it. It's eggs are like half the size. Oh, I see a little baby one out there. Oh, yeah. Oh, there you go. So now you get to see what the slide looks like. And you won't be able to see movement just by gross examination. But you see how there's the chunks of that brown exudate. Oh, it's the same video. Yuck! So there's one still. All right. So if on your test I put this sample was obtained uh, during an ear sampling from a cat. All right. We found a lot of brown exudate on the Q-tip. I hope you can identify it. Okay. This is so common. You guys will absolutely see this in practice. Wait, is it only for cats? Um, it is most common in cats. It can be in dogs, but with cats, it's just that telltale brown gunk coming out of their ears that have the, uh, the eggs in it. All right, so as far as treatment goes, I do want you to know this. The very first thing we have to do with treatment 
is deep clean those ears. Okay? Um, which chances are the ears may bleed a little bit. The skin is going to be very friable. Okay? The term friable in this case is not how we cook an egg. It means that the skin is going to break apart, break down very easily. Okay? So try to be gentle as you can with the cat. Remember, cats love to be told they're a good cat and get treats and pets in between the torture. Um, so we have to get all that gunk as much as we possibly can out of the ear before we put in the treatment. Okay? All right. Um, that's the main things I want you to know about those. All right, now let's talk about chiggers. All right, I'm sure you've learned about chiggers with people. We live in Texas, after all. Uh, but they can affect dogs and cats, too. We just don't think about it as much because, you know, if we walk our pets outside, first off, they're covered in hair, right? So we don't see these little things unless we're down there parting their hair and looking. And if our pets are scratching, we usually think it's allergies or maybe fleas. I don't see any fleas and we move on, think it's gonna pass. And it does, right? They're itchy for a while and then it passes. But chiggers are technically a mite, which makes them an ectoparasite. So we are gonna cover them, okay? Um, what do you guys use for treatment of chiggers? Nail polish. Nail polish. Why does nail polish work? It suffocates. it suffocates them. That is the theory behind it. Um, it's the idea is just to not allow them to come up and breathe and also kind of seal them in their spot so they're not able to move around um, it doesn't always work but yes that is what we use for people please don't put nail polish on your pet okay instead go to the vet there's some nice lidocaine creams lidocaine is a pain medication so it will help calm down the itch all right and then if it's bad enough if the pet was playing in a field and just got inundated with chiggers, all right, they're gonna be pretty miserable. So it's nice to give their body a boost um, by use of a steroid, okay? We can do a skin scraping to identify this, but it's honestly not necessary if we have the history from the client, which almost always includes, I have chiggers too, look doc. And we're like, oh, we do animals, not people, please don't show me, uh, your own legs. But we'll get the story from the owner and then we can visualize the mites, all right? Usually along the dorsum, all right? Along the stomach is where we're really, or I'm sorry, the ventrum, excuse me, along the ventrum is where we are going to see the bites the easiest because it's the least covered in fur. So there we have some pictures on a person. I feel like those are some aggressive little mites. They're quite red. Those are painful. How do we avoid it? Uh, well, stay on the trail, <laughs> um, move out of Texas. I don't know. What did you say? They're everywhere. Yeah. So, yeah, they're, they're hard to avoid. Um, I see a lot of people that like to take their pets to like state parks or um, there's a trail area in Arlington that's really nice and they're constantly letting their pet like run into the woods and into these fields that have high grass. And I'm thinking first off snakes, <laughs> second off it's hot, you know, maybe keep your pet like close to you so you can give them water and, and keep an eye on them. And then chickers, absolutely, not even to mention all the other things that they might find, a skunk, that would be offensive. What? Ticks, absolutely. So yeah, just pay attention. Um, sulfur dust does work really well if you get them in your own house. You just spread some dust around your lawn and it kills them. Also, usually diatomaceous earth works really well too. So, all right, that concludes mites part two. Any questions? Any questions? All right, pause this just in case.